All right. All right. Welcome, everyone, to Pollinators 101, Friends of the Rouge's inaugural lecture. You are here because you have been hearing buzz about pollinators for years now, and you're wondering what the big deal is. Well, today, as a part of Pollinators 101, you're going to learn about how pollinators make our lives better and how you can make a difference on behalf of these teeny tiny creatures throughout our lives. And I'm going to ask you by the end of the day today to take the pollinator pledge, the 2022 pollinator pledge. I want you all as you're participating today to think of one small thing. And I do mean a small thing. The smallest thing uh, typically works best. And do it. Take action. Get something done this year on behalf of pollinators and then build on that as you move forward in your life. So maybe that one small thing is going to be stopping chemical use on your yard. Maybe that one small thing is going to be leaving the leaves this fall. Maybe that one small thing is going to be planting a native plant garden for the first time at your home. Maybe it's going to be a no mow May where you let your lawn go for the entire month of May on behalf of pollinators. Whatever it is, is pick something that works for you and get it done this year. Uh, and so with that, uh, I am also excited to share that uh, you know, to celebrate your being here and uh, your hard work this year coming up on behalf of pollinators, Friends of the Rouge is making door prizes available throughout Earth Week for any activities that you might participate in, including this activity today. Um, and those prizes are, they're, they're fantastic. There's gonna be a native plant garden kit available. There's gonna be a rain barrel starter kit uh, and more. So a lot of exciting things um, to celebrate your efforts. And and um, at the end of today's talk, you'll find out how to get entered into that drawing. And uh, if you're watching today on the recording, it's okay. You can enter by May 4th, 2022 to get entered into the drawings. So, uh, so with that, thank you all once more. I'm going to enter into the screen share again, and we'll get started with Pollinators 101, supporting pollinators at home. My name again is Matthew Bertrand, Senior Restoration Coordinator at Friends of the Rouge. And let's see. All right. Um, so pollinators, we need pollinators for so many reasons, not least for the food crops uh, that our communities enjoy, for wetlands, for nature, the natural areas around us depend upon pollinators, and for beauty as well, to bring four dimensions to our lives, to our gardens. There's so much research about the health benefit of healthy nature uh, and pollinators are an important part of that as well. So, so many things that we need pollinators for. And unfortunately, pollinators may be in trouble. There has been a lot of research over the past decades charting populations of various pollinators from skippers, butterflies, birds, reptiles, bats, and so forth. And across the board, those studies have seen declines, and in many cases, significant declines. For example, 40% of songbirds, 3 billion fewer songbirds across the United States than there had been just a generation before. So major changes. But the good news is we actually can make a difference. And uh, I'd like to take a moment here to acknowledge the hand behind this presentation, Colleen Stern, who is the 2020 Best Friend of the Rouge uh, and is a passionate, passionate advocate for pollinators in our community. She lives in the Livonia area. She developed this presentation and took the vast majority of photographs shown in the presentation today, um, generally where there are not photo credits. So she's a perfect example of someone who is passionate about these issues and is taking charge. And so uh, I think we can all maybe take a moment to thank her for her hard work and enjoy it today as we move forward in today's presentation. So uh, again, I mentioned at the start, the 2022 Pollinator Pledge, and I did say as small as possible. I like to think about your pledge as a seed that you plant and it may grow into a new seed and that seed may grow and it may spread. And so we're all gonna do our part this year, 2022, to make it the year we pick our one small seed to plant, uh, our one activity that we can do and we're gonna watch it grow and spread and we're gonna build on that moving forward. So thank you for being here with us today. A little bit about Friends of the Rouge before I go any farther, just so you know who we are, what we're doing, why we're talking about pollinators today. So Friends of the Rouge is a nonprofit organization 
organization. We were founded in 1986 and we're located here in Southeast Michigan. Um, on this picture, you can see in that map of Michigan, the little white outline, that is the shape of the watershed. That is the land area that drains to any of the branches of the Rouge River. And you can see from this picture that uh, there's a lot of red uh, in that outline there. That's uh, describing the land use type. Uh, and red in this map is urban areas. Uh, and so as you can see, the Rouge River is, as I'm sure you're not surprised, one of the most urbanized rivers in Michigan and in fact in North America. Um, and so this is a river that uh, it has seen a lot of challenges over the years. Uh, I love to take a moment to you know, get some feelings out about the river. Many of us have had interesting histories and relationships with the river, please feel free to type into chat uh, your, you know, what, what comes to mind for you when you think of the Rouge River. And we'll take a moment maybe and uh, see what some of the, uh, the answers are that come out. And there's always a little bit of a delay here. It takes time for people to start typing. So please feel free to type into the chat or if you're on the Facebook Live, type into the Facebook Live about what comes to mind for you when you think of the Rouge River. Uh, a lot of folks, uh, dirty I saw, and that's, that's, that's kind of what I'm gunning for here. Uh, a lot of folks have some really uh, choice words to say about the river and it's just good to get it out there. Uh, so thank you, M. Wells, for sharing that. If anyone else wants to type in, please do. Uh, the river, you know, it has a long storied history. And uh, I'd like to say, I like to think of the river as one that has just given so much uh, to our communities. Um, I see Laura Yannicka says the Rouge Park sledding. So there's a more positive memory. That's great. Um, it's got a long and storied history. It is the river uh, that built the automobile, the Ford Model T. It's the river that built the arsenal of democracy that carried the world through World War I, World War II. Um, it's a river that, as a result of that, has seen a lot of challenges as well, a lot of pollution. Um, it's a river that ran orange for a while from that pollution. It's a river that at times had so much gasoline dumped into it, you couldn't see the orange so much, which was maybe a visual improvement. But as a result, the river caught fire in 1969. It was one of the four industrial rivers that caught fire. And that fire uh, was critical to the passage of the Clean Water Act. Uh, John Dingle uh, was our, you know, our Southeast Michigan uh, representative, and he saw that fire and he acted. He uh, you know, spoke truth to power and he helped to pass that Clean Water Act that has made the river a much safer space today than it had been. Such that on the top right photo here, you can see um, paddlers out by the Ford Rouge plant. That's what that red building in the background is there. We've been taking people out in the river for over a decade now. I was on that very paddle. It is an incredible experience, one that you all need to have in your lives. At Friends of the Rouge, we feel like up north shouldn't be a four hour drive away. It's something we all deserve right in our own backyard. And so we work hard to restore our lands that are drained to this river, to restore this river. And pollinators are a really important part of having a healthy watershed. That's partially what's bringing us all together here. Uh, I see Patty Constable commented on Heinz Drive, a favorite drive right, right along the Rouge floodplain area. Uh, Lara, frogs and kayaking from Diane Rushlow on Facebook. And Megan Oliver says that she's seen lots of interesting waterfowl on the Rouge on their migratory routes. The Rouge is actually a major wildlife corridor. It's one of the primary ways that many um, uh, migrating species move um, from southern areas up through into Canada. So the Rouge is a very important place for habitat. I see Lisa Legriki, and I'm sorry, I think I just got your name pronounced wrong. Um, she lives in the edge of Heinz Park and spent a lot of time canoeing on Newburgh Lake. She grew up in Redford, so she's been close to the Rouge for her entire life. So many of us have these relationships with this river. This river is important, and we have a vision for a clean and vibrant Rouge River that's centering our communities and one that is teeming with pollinators. All right, um, this activity today, Laura mentioned it at the very start, it's a part of Earth Week. This is our inaugural activity for this year's Earth Week. So uh, this is not all that is happening. If you like what you experienced today, make sure to visit therouge.org to find other things that are happening. We've got Lunch and Learns all week. We're gonna talk about native plant gardening, Rain Barrels 101, Rain Gardens 101. You can plant a tree. You can be part of a cleanup effort. You can make a difference this year as a part of Earth Week. Transform your world starting with your hometown river with Friends of the Rouge. So, okay, on to Pollinators 101, what we're actually here for today. 
We're going to talk about four major things as a part of Pollinators 101. We're going to talk about the importance of pollination. What is pollination? Make sure we're all on the same page about that. We're going to talk about our animal pollinators. We're going to talk about threats to pollinators and how you can support pollinators at home. And it's that fourth one, especially where you can really start thinking about your 2022 pollinator pledge. So to get us started, so pollination, what is pollination? The long and short is it's flower sex. Uh, it is how plants go about reproducing themselves um, to make their next generation. And it's especially for plants that have seeds and fruit. So here's an example of some of the seed bearing plants in our lives today that depend upon pollination from the mighty oaks, one of the most important habitat plants out there, to strawberries, uh, which is actually a native Michigan plant uh, and a really important early nectar source for many, um, many pollinators, or some of our native plant populations like this aster plant shown on the right. Uh, these plants depend upon pollination. So what is it literally? It's the transfer of pollen. That's the male genetic material to the, from the male parts of plants to the female parts of plants. And I love this picture here. It's showing pollen, uh, pollen cloud blowing off of a flower. So if you're sneezing this time of year, this is why for some of the many plants that actually don't depend on animals for pollination that uh, take advantage of the wind uh, to move around their male genetic material so that they can pollinate and grow that next generation of plants. Um, most of the time, though, when people are talking about pollination and pollinators, they're thinking not of that wind pollination. They're thinking about animal pollination. And it's that animal pollination that gives us the biggest, showiest flowers that are trying to attract pollinators. Um, and it's those kinds of plants that have high nectar rewards for pollinators. There are also other ways we're not going to talk about today. Water can be used to spread um, that male genetic material and uh, human hands as well. Um, in many places, people have had to supplement pollinators. And uh, for those of you that are saying, but animals are humans. Well, yes, you're right. You are correct. Uh, but we're going to be talking about non-human pollinators mostly today. And we're gonna talk about the importance actually of cross pollination. Um, why it is that it's really important that we get this mixture of materials across different kinds of plants. And the, the opposite of successful cross pollination is inbreeding. And I think we all have a pretty instinctual understanding for why inbreeding is a bad thing. The more cross pollination that we get across our different plants, the stronger those plants are, the more resilient they are, especially to change, to a changing world, to climate change, to the changes that our society is imposing upon the natural areas and the pollinators around us. So cross pollination is really important for plants. And I I do want to mention um, just a fun way to think about uh, all of this. Uh, it's really, it's, it's thinking like a plant. So much of today is about thinking like other creatures. Um, you cannot think about pollination without thinking about just how incredibly intelligent these plants are. We don't always give them credit for it. Um, I, I heard this through a Michael Pollan uh, book, um, Botany of Desire, thinking about corn especially. We're used to thinking about you know, how incredibly powerful we are for having transformed so much of the world to grow so much corn, which is really helping to stain our populations. But you can think about it the other way around, how incredibly smart corn was to trick us into growing so much corn everywhere. Corn is a very successful plant. Um, Plants everywhere have spent thousands of years figuring out how to take advantage of insects, of other pollinators to get us to do their bidding uh, to, to help spread their species around. So fun, different ways of thinking about the plant animal relationships here for pollination. But that at the end of the day, that is what the pollination process is. It's how these plants are getting their genetic material moved around and the impacts that that has on our society from the crops that we're eating and depending upon for our, um, our cultures from the, the natural areas around us that is the pollination process. We're gonna focus in now though on our animal pollinators. Um, some of the different kinds of animals that are out there doing pollination services. Um, and so moving on. So most people, when they're thinking about pollination, they're thinking about save the bees, they're thinking about honeybees. It's really important though to realize that it's way, way more than honeybees. Actually, honeybees are actually a minor pollinator. There are so many other species that are pollinating from bats, 
um, like the flying fox fruit bat up above, to the milkweed beetle on the right, the white winged dove, the great black wasp, the viceroy butterfly, and in the center, that gecko reptiles as well. So many species that are doing important pollination work all around the world. There are all kinds of pollinators, more than 200,000 species that help pollinate. This picture here is a black and white ruffed lemur in Madagascar. This is the largest not human pollinator in the entire world. So just to give you a glimpse of some of the diversity in the world for different kinds of pollinations, it pollinates the traveler's palm that it's sitting on there that you can see. It has a specific relationship with that plant. So once you start getting into pollination, there's so much to discover um, in the world around you about how plants are relating with different animal species um, to go about their business. There's a whole world outside of ourselves that's just waiting literally out your back door to discover. But so there are many pollinators, but insects are really the powerhouse of pollination. You know, there are what, like 7 billion of us today. There are so many more insects out there. Insects outnumber us by far. They are so little, they are perfectly attuned to pollination on so many species. They are the species that are getting the bulk of the pollination work done. And you can see here many examples. We're gonna talk about bees, butterflies, moths, beetles, even wasps and flies. So insects that, Many people view with maybe a little bit of disgust, maybe a little bit of, I don't want that around my life, around my yard, um, but they are all important pollinators. And we're gonna talk about why they actually do fit into your yard. Um, so first though, let's start with honeybees. Let's get the honeybee situation out of the way. So honeybees are actually not native to North America. They were imported from Europe. And it's not to say that they're not welcome here. I, I personally use honey pretty regularly in my life. I love it, um, growing bees in your backyard is a great activity, um, but it's important to think beyond the honeybee as well. There are many more pollinators out there that we're going to step through that are critically important. And um, the reality is that much of our pollination in North America is vulnerable right now because of colony collapse disorder. Uh, many of our honeybee hives are having a hard time right now due to disease. Uh, and uh, part of it is that they're just very vulnerable. This picture here showing this truck, that is a truck that is loaded with honeybee hives. The reality is that there are about 2.6 million commercial hives that get loaded up on trucks like this and driven around North America, providing pollination services to farms. It starts often in California down south, and then those beehives get moved all the way up to Northern Michigan as the season progresses. And those bees are just pollinating, pollinating every step of the way. It's so weird. It's so wild that this is something that actually happens. But that's it's what's happening. That's it's what's happening in many of our commercial agricultural fields. And it's like I said, it's vulnerable um, because of disease stresses. It's making our agriculture much more susceptible um, to failure as a result. This is not a resilient system. And so having lots of other species, lots of our native species as well, that's a much more resilient species, not putting all of our eggs in one basket and honeybees. So here's a great example of some of the native bees. There are more than 4,000 species of bees native to US. Many of them are endangered. Most of them are solitary, often ground nesting bees. They're not hive bees. And most of them are non-stinging gentle bees. Here's a picture of the rusty patch bumblebee. that is a critically endangered uh, native bee species here in the Midwest. So great example um, of a native pollinator. Beetles are actually our largest group of pollinators, more than 30,000 species native in the US, more than 400,000 species worldwide. They manage pollination for over 80% of the world's flowering plants, including many of the plants that we like to eat. Uh, and so without beetles, we're missing out on a lot of our pollination. Butterflies, of course, the lovable ambassadors of the pollen nation, sorry for the pun, um, very important pollinators, but relatively minor compared to the others. However, they are so beautiful, so attractive, they are those ambassadors. They are what brings many of us into our interest in pollination, and that's great because when we're gardening for butterflies, we're also often gardening for these many other species that are important as well. All right, we're gonna take a moment to show some gratitude for a, a, an underappreciated pollinator out there. Um, and that is the fly. 
Flies are pollinators too. Many of us look at flies uh, with disgust. We think of them as you know, associated with death, with trash, uh, but there are actually many different kinds of flies out there. The house fly is not the only kind of fly. This picture is showing a hover fly, which is another example of a native fly. And many of them are bee mimics. You actually might think they are a bee if you're not looking closely. And this is very smart of them because um, you know, bees are maybe a little bit more intimidating than your, your standard fly out there. So it helps them to survive. And uh, if you're somebody that likes spicy herbs, that's a great example of a kind of plant that is often pollinated by flies. And there are many other plants that get pollinated by flies as well. At Park, we actually have a fly pollination garden with pawpaws, a native shrub, with wild ginger, which is a beautiful native plant as well, and, um, and um, witch hazel as well are other great examples of plants that are fly pollinated. So let's all take a moment to express our gratitude to the flies in our world that are pollinating for us. All right, um, next, our example or opportunity for gratitude. Uh, and how many of you in this room like chocolate? I have a feeling that probably most of you are raising your hands right now. Believe it or not, you have a midge fly to thank for the chocolate that you love. Uh, they look like mosquitoes. They are not mosquitoes, uh, but they have a specific relationship with the chocolate plant. So uh, a great example of that insect and um, you know, beloved crop relationship. Um, so, so much of the importance in our world built upon such teeny, teeny, tiny, creatures. Um, our next example for gratitude uh, is moths. And, uh, you know, we don't tend to think about moths very often. You know, we, we think about butterflies, especially, is our, our much more attractive um, relative of the moth. Um, there's been a lot of research lately that shows that moths actually might do a whole lot more pollination than we gave them credit for. You know, in the past, people have tended to think about like moon gardens, you know, white flowering uh, nighttime plants as being the primary plants that moths are pollinating. But there's new evidence that they're actually really important for our pollinate or for our crops. They're the kind of a second shift that's pollinating at night and that they tend to travel a lot farther than bees do. So moths are actually becoming recognized as an increasingly important pollinator. And um, some of them are also very attractive and worthy, worthy not just for their value, but worthy of your attention for their aesthetic as well. This is a picture of a rosy maple moth here, a beautiful moth that's native to our Michigan area. All right, and uh, here's another chance uh, to share a pollinator that you might not uh, first come to mind as the kind of pollinator you might like to attract. Lara mentioned at the start, there was an article just like two days ago that came out about the value of wasps as pollinators. Wasps get a really bad rap. Many of us have had an experience maybe mowing our lawn. We've had a ground nesting uh, wasp patch. We've gotten a few bites out of it and we come away um, having a uh, strong opinion, shall we say, about the value of wasps around us. Um, wasps are regularly poisoned, people trying to get them out of their yards. The reality though is that most wasps are solitary. Um, they are not hive oriented. They are not um, as um, territorial as the few that are giving wasps in general a bad rap. So this picture is showing the great black wasp, a Michigan native, and that is Colleen Sturm's hand right next to it there showing that this is a gentle wasp generally. It's shy and solitary. It's there to do its business. Um, flowers are where these wasps are eating. They are not interested in fighting near flowers. Um, and uh, they're actually doing a really important service as well. In addition to the pollination, they're oftentimes predators that are killing other bugs that can be destructive to our crops. So if you've got a vegetable garden in your yard, oftentimes those wasps are the ones that are killing the bugs that are eating your vegetables. So wasps perform really important services generally in addition to their pollination, and they are worthy of your efforts to attract to your yard. Uh, here's another uh, opportunity to thank a pollinator. So if you're somebody that likes figs, figs are pollinated by a fig wasp. That is a specialist relationship. That fig wasp is the primary pollinator on figs. So a great example of a specific relationship with the pollinator. Um, across the world, there are other pollinators in addition to insects that are more important. This tends to be in tropical and desert regions, especially where other pollinators are more important. Here in Michigan, insects tend to be our most important pollinators. Um, White-winged doves shown on the left is a primary pollinator for the saguaro cactus in the deserts of the Southwest. 
Um, bats, uh, many North American bats, they're chomping on mosquitoes first and foremost, which we all appreciate, even though that's not a pollinator service, but they're also oftentimes pollinating um, uh, plants as well in desert and tropical areas. Geckos pollinate many tropical plants, and we already showed that lemur on the right that pollinates the traveler's palm. So many important pollinator species around the world. Um, do you like wildflowers? Well, then let's thank the hummingbird as an important pollinator for many of our wildflowers here in Michigan. Um, the plant on the left, that is a native honeysuckle vine. And you can see those long tubular flowers that are great for hummingbirds. Hummingbirds are really important pollinators here in Michigan on many of our native wildflower species. So another, another opportunity to thank a pollinator and to value one in our lives. Another chance to thank a pollinator, are you someone that likes bananas? mangoes or uh, tequila, well, then a fruit bat actually is uh, something you should be showing gratitude for, uh, primary pollinators for these plant species. Uh, and some of these bats are very, very large and, and actually can be charismatic. Uh, here's a great picture of a fruit bat here. Um, and uh, it's again, it's a pollinist we should all be grateful for. Um, so as we're thinking about different kinds of pollinators out there, it's important to be aware of two major classes of pollinators. There's pollination generalists, there's pollination specialists. And so a great example of a generalist pollinator is that honeybee. Um, honeybees can pollinate just about anything that's out there. They are not picky about what plants they like to pollinate. Um, and generally plants are very open to having lots of different species pollinate them. Um, they want oftentimes to have um, a, a wide range of species that are able to pollinate for them. So there's different evolutionary advantages here, but there are also specialists. Uh, and so something just to be aware of when we're learning about pollinators, that sometimes some plants are very specific about the pollinator that they attract and some insects some pollinators are very specific about the plant that they appreciate. So on the left is an example of one-way specialization, a blueberry digger bee. It's specialized for blueberry flowers. Um, and so that's an example of um, a plant that it can, it can be pollinated by other plants, but that blueberry digger bee, its primary preference is that blueberry flower. That's a one-way example. There's also two ways, and the one on the right is showing that a yucca moth and a yucca plant. They're both specialists. So the only thing that can pollinate that yucca uh, plant is the uh, yucca moth, and the only thing that that yucca moth pollinates is the yucca plant. They are dependent upon each other. They live and die together. So uh, great examples of some of the fascinating stories that are out there once you start diving into pollination. Okay, with that, so we've gone through the pollination pot process. We've gone through our animal pollinators. I'd love to just pause for a moment. Does anybody have any questions so far? Let's just take a break. We're about at the halfway point here. Uh, maybe take a couple minute break. And uh, I'll take any questions from the audience uh, before we move into threats to pollinators and ways that you can support pollinators at home. So we'll, we'll reconvene. Uh, this will be a, maybe a four minute break at 1235. And I'll take any questions that have built up in the, those four minutes. Feel free to use the Q&A or the chat for your questions. I always do this. I give people a break and then I wait for questions and you're all taking your break. So of course there's no questions. And that's fine. Take your break, come back refreshed. We'll get going again at 1235.
Oh, I hear Dave is on Facebook and he's saying great class. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to Dave Cerilli actually. He's with Plymouth Pollinators, which is a new nonprofit in the Plymouth area and uh, a great opportunity for you if you're interested in doing more, you know, do more with Friends of the Rouge, do more with Plymouth Pollinators, do more with your local organization as well. Uh, there's so many great groups out there that are working diligently on behalf of the pollinators in our lives. And so Dave, thank you so much for tuning in today on Facebook. And I'll add actually that uh, Dave, along with about 80 other folks in Southeast Michigan, just finished up taking the Master Rain Gardener class. And so um, as you're thinking about pollinators, I, I love, I, and I think I'm gonna do it later on, uh, giving a plug out there for rain gardens is a great way to create habitat for pollinators and solve water issues at the same time. Great gold standard landscape practice that's multifunctional, that's solving lots of problems at the same time. 12.33, we're gonna take two more minutes for our break here. So come on back in two minutes, two minutes. Feel free to, answer, uh, to ask any questions you might have in those two minutes. If I see something in the Q and A, let's see. Let's see, Eric Andre is asking, will you review Michigan's five most important pollinators? Also, is that different for the Metro Detroit area, lower Michigan? So, how do you identify and catalog the most important pollinators? Um, when we're starting to talk about important like that, there's value judgments that happen. And so that's, that's a very difficult kind of list to put together and not one I feel qualified to do. I think it'd be really interesting to engage with some of our leading experts here in academia um, or uh, in some of the other more specialized nonprofit groups to get their take on it. But I would always be aware that any list like that is going to be an opinion uh, in different groups, different people are gonna have different levels of support behind why it is that they developed that opinion. Uh, and, um, and the reality, if we think broadly, if we think like a plant, if we think like a pollinator, uh, every plant is gonna have a different list of the most important pollinators that are specific to it as well. Uh, and uh, if you ask those pollinators, they're gonna have a list of plants that are most important as well. So, uh, so important is, is very subjective um, and there are so many different ways to catalog it. Um, we will get into some ways in today's talk about how to go about getting started, maybe picking one pollinator to support, trying to, to make it simple, um, but we won't get more broadly into any kind of list like that. Uh, the other question as a part of that was about Metro Detroit versus um, you know, maybe the rest of Michigan. And the reality, we will, I'll show you uh, one example for how to get a little bit more specific um, about your region. Uh, pollinators are regional, uh, certainly when we think about state to state, but even within cities, um, there are some microclimates for pollinators. And uh, I'm seeing another question that just came through. This will be my last question that I answer now, and then we will get um, going. Um, and that question, it's an anonymous question. How do pollinators find the plants? Will they find a new patch of flowers? There's nothing else around them that interests them. Ah, that, that is a very good question. And it's something of a conundrum when it comes to urban pollinator populations. How do pollinators find the plants? Um, this is oftentimes framed as the, uh, if you build it, will they come? The field of dreams question in ecology. And the answer is in part, you know, we don't always know um, whether or not the pollinators are going to find the plants, and especially if you choose to focus in on a really specialist insect, maybe one that lives in high quality nature areas, it might not find its way for you. But many will, many do. Um, and, you know, the more that you, uh, the closer you are to nature, the big natural areas, the more likely they find you, the more uh, patches that there are in your neighborhood, the more likely they will find you as well. And so the way I like to think about it is you know, your garden, it's not necessarily going to attract everything, but it's going to attract something. And when you plant a garden, you are showing for your neighbors um, that they can also plant gardens. And the more that you and your neighborhood are doing this, the more pollinators will come over time. And over time with climate change, pollinators are gonna be increasingly moving their range. And so even if right now they're not finding you, they might find you someday. So I think it's really important, as I mentioned with the, the pollinator pledge to do something, to pick something to do and get started. And you will definitely support at least some pollinators with your efforts.
So with that, I'm going to get back to our agenda. Today, Pollinators 101. So we talked about the pollination process. What is pollination? We did an overview of some of our different animal pollinators out there. We're going to talk about some of the threats now to pollinators. And then we're going to bring it home with some of the support options that you can do at home to support pollinators. So um, overview of some of the threats. Uh, three primary threats, habitat loss um, that are in those first two uh, icons shown there pesticides, chemicals, and then lastly, disease are some of the major issues that our pollinators are experiencing today. In addition to these threats, so we're going to talk about some ways to do better as well. So some, some jumps on some of the later, later options. So, so first is loss of habitat space. And um, there's a lot of different ways that that loss of habitat can happen. Um, think about all of our urban areas across the Rouge, all of these parking lots, buildings, lawn areas especially, um, these do not provide habitat. It used to be that there were diverse native ecosystems in these places that supported an incredible variety of species, not just pollinators. Uh, we don't have as much of that anymore. That loss, that shrinkage of habitat is a huge part of the issue. Here in the Rouge, I think that we're down to um, maybe 10%, uh, something like that of our original natural areas. We've got a lot of parks um, within that area, but about 50% of our land is single family homes. And so that's a huge change, but it's also a huge opportunity. There's so many homes in the Rouge that, uh, and our homes are a great place to be doing things like native plant gardens. So that loss of habitat is a huge issue, but you can do something about it, um, whether it's through rain gardens, sidewalk gardens, green roofs, home gardens, expanding that habitat. Um, when we're talking loss of habitat, we cannot ignore agriculture. Um, there's maybe 900 million or so acres of farmland in the U.S. now, and that's about five times the state of Texas. So if you imagine five Texases across the U.S., that's how much agriculture we've got. And um, agriculture does not automatically mean death trap for pollinators. Um, there are great examples of small uh, farms um, that are much more diverse in their crops. Um, those are the um, CSA farms, the community supported agricultural farms in your community, those small traditional typically, but not always organic farms. They're not planting those giant monocultures that we tend to think of nowadays that are shown in that picture on the top right, that traditional uh, farm field that's all one crop, all corn, all soybean, all wheat, nothing else for hundreds of acres around it. Um, that is a huge habitat loss, those massive monocultural farms. And so you can be a part of change for this by buying more of your uh, food from some of those smaller farms in your area. Um, also through advocacy and awareness, um, there are new methods of doing traditional farming, those monoculture farms that are better. The picture on the bottom left is showing a prairie strip. Um, Iowa universities are um, researching these as a way to support pollinators and actually increase yields in our traditional agriculture. It doesn't work for all crops, but especially for crops that are pollinated like soybeans, these prairie strips have been shown oftentimes to actually increase yield. So it's a win-win supporting pollinators and supporting agriculture. Um, and even for farms that don't have plants that are pollinated by insects, these prairie strips often help to maintain soils, reducing erosion, which is a huge problem on all of our agriculture. So there are win-win solutions out there that make our agriculture work better for us and for pollinators. And when we do things for pollinators, that also helps us. All right. Um, so in addition to habitat loss, pesticides are also an issue for pollinators. 75% of US households use pesticides. That means probably many people on the call today are using pesticides in your lawn to kill insects, to kill weeds, whatever it is you're doing, these tend to be bad for the pollinators in our lives as well. And if there's one takeaway from today, I think it's really important to keep in mind that those pesticides are not just bad for pollinators, they're also bad for the small um, people in our lives and the small pets who we think of as people in our lives, dogs and children especially, are playing in our lawns. Um, they are very small, their bodies are small. And so they're more impacted by the pesticide loads that we're putting on our lawns. Um, they are um, harmed 
by many of the pesticides that we put on our lawns. They are the most susceptible. And so it's really important that we find ways to reduce our pesticide use, not just for pollinators, but also for the other important um, people in our lives as well. So pesticide use is a major problem for pollinators. The last one that we'll mention today, viruses, fungi, and parasites. And this is of course a huge conversation, but um, to wrap it up in a quick nutshell, um, you can see here one example of a traditional way of supporting pollinators. Um, that hummingbird feeder up there versus a more natural way. When we use these artificial feeders, there's um, evidence out there that it facilitates the spread of harmful diseases that impact hummingbirds. So the more that we can shift from ways of supporting pollinators that are about us, um, so these, these you know, bird feeders, to more natural ways, planting plants in our yards, like this hairy beard tongue here, which is a hummingbird magnet. Uh, if we can provide more natural plant-based ways of supporting the pollinators in our lives, that is solving a lot of the virus, fungi, and parasite issues. Um, and uh, beyond hummingbirds, you know, bats are really heavily hit right now by white nose syndrome. Um, and there's also viruses hitting caterpillars, hitting hummingbirds. Um, and we already talked about bees getting hit by, um, by some viruses as well. So a lot of issues with viruses, fungi, and parasites on our pollinators. So, so that's our threats in a nutshell. Um, we talked about a little bit about some of the things you can do uh, about those threats as we went through, but now, now is the what you can do for pollinators. This is really that time to think about your 2022 pollinator pledge. We're gonna step through a lot of things that you can do in your own backyard to help pollinators. Uh, and so I want you, as you're hearing these things, to think through you know, what makes sense for you this year, Maybe, maybe what makes sense, maybe for a future year, maybe something you can grow to, and maybe something that's maybe just not going to be your cup of tea. And it's okay. Not everyone has to do everything, but we want everyone to do something. So to find your one thing you can do this year, that's what we're going to um, look into next. And to get us started with it, um, I want to get us oriented around one backyard um, that uh, models some of the change on a bigger scale maybe than what you're ready for this year, um, but an example of how this is possible and how it can look great. Uh, so this is uh, an example of a lawn with some problems. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about lawn problems. Lawns uh, have their issues. And this one, as you can see, is, uh, is just not working very well, right? It's not soaking up water very well. It's getting flooded. It's not providing habitat. This is a lawn that has problems and that can be better for pollinators and for other issues as well. I want you to focus in on a few key areas. So not just the water, but this area, this area. And let's show some after here. And I, at this point, I'm going to give you the, the um, spoiler alert that this is actually my backyard <laughs> here, showing some of the issues I saw when I moved in a couple years ago in my Ann Arbor neighborhood here. And so this picture is showing um, after my first year, actually, it's 2020, after uh, a year of pandemic uh, gardening, trying to solve some of these problems. I built some rain gardens in the back. I focused your area over here. You can see a pollinator garden going in. I ended up lining the bed in a nice strong arcing curve. And then I started laying down cardboard to kill the grass and prepare the way for planting. On the bottom, you can see one that I'd already actually laid cardboard down and then mulched. And I planted it with a whole bunch of native plants. Um, so increasing my habitat area, reducing my lawn, but still keeping an attractive lawn space. Um, one that I'm still able to use for my daughters, ages three and six now, they love to run around. And I have to say, they actually love playing in the native plant gardens at this point, almost more than the lawn itself. They find all kinds of things to discover, um, nooks and crannies to hide in that they hadn't had available to them before. So this lawn is a much better lawn for people, for my family to live in, and it's much better for pollinators. I'm gonna have you focus in on an area over here now and show what I did the year after that. Um, I ended up removing about 400 square feet of asphalt, which is a part of my water problem, and planted a new rain garden on the right side as well. And I'm excited to get more pictures at the end of, uh, or midway through this growing season to show the ongoing evolution here. Uh, so this is a, an example of you know, one lawn um, getting taken to you know, a good positive outcome on behalf of pollinators and on behalf of a more livable yard. So um, one wrapping it up pollinator solutions. I'm going to break that down for you now. That was a lot. So we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about healthy lawn care. Just managing your lawn differently is going to have a big impact for pollinators. We're going to talk about ways to create habitat and ways to get involved as well. So 
lawns. We're going to take a moment with lawns. Um, there is a perception out there in society that lawns are what we need to have. And, and there's a lot of reason for that um, historically. And it mostly goes to um, culturally here in the United States, here in Michigan, we like to be good neighbors. We have this perception that being a good neighbor means having a well-maintained lawn, having a well-maintained property. And so we all do our best to be good neighbors for our neighbors. And that means something like what you see here in this picture. Um, but that's not necessarily something that we are choosing to do. It's if you polled your neighbors, um, I doubt all of your neighbors, I doubt many of your neighbors necessarily will say that this is actually something that they like. Most of us are doing it out of a sense of a civic duty. And that's a good thing, right? This is a good value that we have, the civic mindedness. But we need to be ready to adapt. The world is changing around us. And there are lots of ways to be civic minded. Um, and having that 100% lawn in your front yard, that's, that's not the way anymore. Being civic minded means doing more to incorporate those native plants and to support pollinators. And the good news is there's a lot of research out there that you can shrink your front lawn by as much as 50%, as long as you're keeping your native plant gardens neat in your front yards, your neighbors, they won't really notice that much. They won't care, they'll be grateful for it. And when you do that, you're giving your neighbors then permission to be civic minded in their own yard and to plant more native plants. So I recommend everyone think about starting small. Think about maybe, um, one small native plant garden area, get that going, and then just slowly expand it over time. So never start off with more than you can chew. Start with a small section of lawn. Front yard is great because it's, it's a part of that civic mindedness. It's giving your neighbors permission. It's planting that seed that will um, reap for future generations. But if you're nervous about working in your front yard, start in your backyard. Your backyard is your private space. And I highly recommend everyone have wild, diverse, messy backyard spaces that are doing so much for pollinators. Um, healthy lawn care. So we're gonna talk about some best practices for healthy lawn care. Um, and the reason we're talking healthy lawn care is to get you off of chemicals, to get you off of fertilizers. There's lots of ways to maintain your lawn that will result in a green, healthy lawn that don't require those chemicals. And it starts with wise watering. Um, so that's watering less often, if at all, lawns actually don't need water. Um, but watering, if you're going to water, watering more deeply and less often to help encourage deep roots. So we want those roots to go deeper down. That's gonna have the lawn be healthier and then it's not gonna need as many chemicals. And uh, mowing less often, mowing higher, about three inches height um, in the spring is great. In the summer, even four inches height, that's gonna help keep the lawn from browning out in the summertime. Um, doing these practices, uh, mulching the, um, um, uh, lawn clippings back into the lawn, that's going to be what helps you get off of um, fertilizers and off of toxins. When your lawn is healthier, then it fights off grubs. When your lawn is healthier, it doesn't get as many of the pests um, that, um, that um, get in there, and you're not going to have as many weeds as well. Uh, that said, though, those weeds are serving an important purpose. So when you're mowing high, you're also allowing things like dandelions and violets and um, um, clovers to bloom. And so your lawn, even if you just have lawn, even if you don't do native plant gardens, that lawn is going to be able to provide much more of a habitat space. Uh, there's a new practice coming out this year, No Mow May. Great example. If you do nothing else from this talk, uh, search for No Mow May, learn about it. Uh, great opportunity for you to be a you know, lazy mower. Uh, ah, it's No Mow May. It's not that I don't like mowing my lawn. It's No Mow May. Uh, a way for you to have your lawn help pollinators out. Um, leaving the leaves uh, in your lawn in the fall, mowing them in if you have to, but if you can put those leaves in a garden bed and leaving them there, there are many pollinators whose life cycles depend upon those leaves. They hide in the leaves. And when you get rid of the leaves, you're throwing pollinators out the door. Um, there's also a healthy lawn care program out there. If you're hiring contractors to manage your lawn, look at that program. You'll find contractors that have committed to better ways to maintaining lawns. Um, the thing to remember, is that pollinators thrive in the messy jumble of actual nature. So you do actually want more than just that turf grass, you want diversity in that lawn. 
So there's a lot of noise out there with um, how to get started with this. And what I want you to think about is uh, an easy way to do this is to think about one pollinator to focus in on. There's so many pollinators out there. There's so many plants. Look up one pollinator um, and look up what its needs are and try to put in what it needs. Um, if everyone does that, that's going to be what creates the best habitat for different types of pollinator species. If we try to you know, do something for everyone, sometimes we're not actually doing enough for any one species. So if you can pick a pollinator, whether it's from a guidebook that you found or whether it's from an internet website, I'll share some in a sec, um, pick one and do the best you can for that one. That's gonna be your best bet. Um, ways to pick pollinators, and I, I was gonna step through these, but I'm noticing the time it's 1252. So I'm maybe not gonna step through these, but uh, National Wildlife Federation's native plant finder on the left here, um, you can look up native plants and then find butterflies that like it, or you can look for butterflies and then see the plants that it likes, that's great. MSU has got a great pollinators website. You can learn more about pollinator gardening there. You can also go to butterfliesandmoths.org. That's a citizen science project. You can actually report what you find. You can see what's being found in your area and you can learn an incredible amount about any one butterfly or moth species. So try to find one thing to support and go from there when you're thinking about building habitat. And then beyond that, think about your constraints. Um, how much space do you have? Um, how much can you maintain? Never build beyond your capacity to maintain. Keep it within your realm of capacity. What you can do for yourself, more than you can do is not helping anyone. Uh, more than you can do is going to mean probably a garden that doesn't look as good and that's not convincing anyone to make changes at their yard. Better a lot of us do a little than a few of us achieve perfection. So do what you can do, not more than you can do. Uh, so some examples, um, small and easy. You can plant a few flowers for American ladies. It's a beautiful uh, native butterfly. It's larval host plant. So what it's caterpillar likes to eat are pearly everlastings or pussy toes. These are two relatively small and easy care native plants. Um, it's a migrating plant, so it doesn't need overwinter care. Um, and it's migrating generations. They generally like early and late season nectar. So if you can get early and late bloomers, that's a really important thing. Uh, so one example of what it would mean to design for specific pollinators. Uh, here's another example. Uh, morning cloaks are a great native butterfly. It's one of the first that we see, and that's because it's one of the few that actually overwinters as an adult. It hides in the crack of tree bark, and so you'll see it flying around um, early, early in spring. It actually freezes and thaws all winter time. It's larval host plant, so but its caterpillars like to eat birch, cottonwood, elm, pussy willow. Great example. So that's one you could try to design around. Um, maybe you want to support ground bees, uh, and uh, maybe you're the kind of person that doesn't want to mow as much, then ground bees are going to give you that excuse. And so if you're letting your grass get a little bit bigger, you're not mowing as much, you're doing no mow may, you're um, not spraying your lawn anymore, maybe you're planting a few nectar native flowers um, to support the bees, that's going to be helping those ground bees out. Um, maybe you're someone that can leave the leaves. Uh, in that case, uh, here's an example of one pollinator you might support, uh, the clear wing moth. These are day flying moths. If you're not careful, you might confuse it with a hummingbird. They fly around like hummingbirds. They are incredible. And their larva nest, uh, they overwinter in the leaf litter at the base of the host shrubs that those caterpillars like to eat. So viburnum, cherry, plum, hawthorn, honeysuckle are some of the examples. At Park, we planted 300 native honeysuckle shrubs to support um, these um, hummingbird moth. So ho hopefully we'll get to see some this year uh, visiting us there. Um, a few things to remember, and these are going to be just some quick rules of thumb. Try to get where you can local native genotypes as much as you can. And that means buying from native plant nurseries or local plant nurseries that know what it means to support native genotypes. This means not so much cultivars, uh, like things that are advertised as like double blooms or like you know, blooming all season or changing the colors or changing the heights. Um, those plants don't always have as good a nectar or pollen resources uh, to support pollinators. So from a habitat standpoint, straight native species is the best. It's not to say you can't use um, those attractive garden plants, those um, cultivars, but just be conscientious about where you're doing it and why. Those plants are going to be primarily for beauty, for you and your eyes, not so much for pollinators. Local genotypes are the way to go, and that's a whole conversation. Uh, another just quick rule of thumb is to group your plants together and mass. 
And the great thing is that this is something that looks good for you, for your eyes, and it looks good for pollinators as well. Don't just plant like one of this and one of that and one of that over there. Plant big masses. Uh, and that's cheaper oftentimes. You can buy a big flat of plants rather than like one or two here and there. Uh, and our eyes uh, appreciate seeing those big masses as well. So this is a great way to support pollinators and to make your gardens look better. And then as much as possible, don't chop down your dead vegetation in the fall. Leave that stuff up through the spring, through like early May when it's warming up uh, 50 degrees at night, ideally, so that pollinators are coming to life. Uh, the good thing is that that makes your garden more interesting all wintertime. You see all the texture throughout. It's not just a flat, boring space. So it looks better for you. And there's also seeds that are going to be feeding the birds in addition. Many of our native bees are nesting in the stalks that are left behind from the previous year. And so when we can leave them there, it gives them time to hatch out to come to life. Um, when you chop down your old vegetation in the fall and you discard it, you are throwing away many pollinators. All right, and this will be my last things to remember here. And this is for those of you out there that like to get more active. Maybe this is more than just, you know, lazy gardener, I'm gonna plant and forget about it. You wanna actually be more active, or maybe you wanna create some viewing areas for pollinators near you. So you can get more active by providing very, very shallow water, not deep bird baths, much more shallow. Um, and possibly even with a little bit of sand mixed in there with that shallow water. Um, or you can think about fruit slices. Uh, there's an example of an orange slice there. Many male butterflies get attracted to that kind of thing. Um, they're getting salt from this. They're getting nectar resources from it as well. Um, so this is if, you're, you know, if you've got children, you're interested in making this more of a hobby, it's something you can do. So with that, I'm gonna wrap it up. We're almost at the end here. Um, we talked about pollination process, how pollination happens, our animal pollinators out there. We talked about threats to pollinators and what you can do at home. I hope you are thinking about your 2022 pollinator pledge, the thing you can do, whether it's leaving the leaves, whether it's a no mow may, maybe it's not doing any pesticides or fertilizers this year. Uh, maybe it's planting a native plant garden, whatever it is. I hope that you thought through your thing you can do. If you like what you heard today, I deeply encourage you all to visit the rouge.org slash member, become a member. Friends of the Rouge is a membership organization. It's because of all of you, our members that help to make efforts like today possible. Uh, more than just becoming a member, you can leave your legacy with an endowment. If your corporation does corporate sponsorships, talk to us. We can do good things together on behalf of Southeast Michigan nature. Um, with that, thank you all for joining Pollinators 101. My name again, Matthew Bertrand. Um, uh, I'm going to stick around for another 15 minutes or so for questions. Um, but before we get to questions, for those of you that have been waiting for the door prize, here you go. We're going to go to the rouge.org slash eval dash P. Uh, and that is going to be where you can go to fill out an evaluation for this workshop today. And when you finish that evaluation, you get the link to where you can enter the door prize. And that's gonna be for some of the items in our native plant sale this year. So a native plant kit pre-designed for you. You don't have to design it. Um, and it's gonna take all the effort out of making a native plant garden or a rain barrel starter kit, taking the effort out of getting started with the rain barrel. Um, these are gonna be items that are available on our store this year that you can also just buy to help you get started as well. All of these products have sliding scale prices, so the price will not be an obstacle to anyone that wants to get started and participate in these efforts. Um, if you are watching a recording, don't worry, you can still enter by May 4th, 2022 uh, to get entered into that drawing. And somebody will, uh, if it not me, drop that link into the chat so that you can go enter that evaluation. And keep in mind that you know, it's one entry per person per event. That means if you uh, join us again uh, later this week for Rain Barrels 101, for Native Plant Garden,